Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the Federal Society's event on citizenship and the census. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. Very pleased to welcome you all here today, and I want to thank in advance our panel, and especially our moderator, Stuart Taylor. Before we begin, I want to let you know that we did have a bit of a medical emergency here in the room, uh, and the gentleman received assistance, and we're told he's going to be fine, but if you'd like to get an update, we'll, if we get an update from the, from the hospital, uh, we'll certainly let you know. Um, but our thoughts are with him, of course. Uh, I mentioned our moderator, Stuart Taylor. He's an author, a journalist here in the Washington, D.C. He's a somewhat of a Federal Society regular. Uh, you've seen him before. He's well known to us, so I won't introduce him at length, but I do want to thank him uh, for his role as our moderator here today. Stuart. Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to the Federalist Society's panel discussion titled Citizenship, the Road Ahead on issues surrounding, it was initially titled Citizenship, and I said, yeah, what else? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, it's now Citizenship, the Road Ahead on issues surrounding the Trump administration's ongoing effort to collect and make publicly available more information about the numbers of citizens, non-citizens, and illegal immigrants in the country. This effort includes the administration's plan to include a question about citizenship in the decennial census. Now starting in the year 2030, that is because the Supreme Court's June 27 decision in Department of Commerce versus New York made it logistically impossible, in the Attorney General's words, to include the question in the 2020 census. We have three expert panelists to my left. John S. Baker, who will speak first, is Professor Emeritus at the Louisiana State University's Paul M. Hebert Law Center and Chairman of Our Citizenship Counts, a group of scholars and other interested people. He has taught and lectured at universities in the United States and abroad and has been a consultant to various government bodies. David B. Rivkin, Jr. is a leading practitioner of appellate and constitutional law in Washington, D.C. He served in the White House Counsel's Office and Department of Justice during the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. He's also a frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal. W. Neal Eggleston, at the far end, is a broadly experienced litigation partner in the Washington office of Kirkland and Ellis. His public service includes White House Counsel for President Obama from 2014 to 2017, Associate Counsel for President Clinton from 1993 to 1994, and Deputy Chief Counsel of the House Iran-Contra Committee from 1987 to 1988. Our format is as follows. John will take about three minutes to introduce the topic and say what this is all about. Then he first, and then David and then Neil will make opening statements, all from the podium, of six minutes each. After the opening statements, I will ask questions of the panelists and they will exchange views with one another until about 1.30. I will then invite members of the audience to join in the questioning. We will stop at 2 p.m. if not before. John, please proceed. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, David and Neil, for joining us here today. My introduction is going to be geared to the home audience on C-SPAN. That means that as much as possible, I will attempt to eliminate legalese. Our Constitution requires, quote, an enumeration every 10 years. We otherwise know that as the census. So this is all about the upcoming 2020 census. And every 10 years, there's a great deal of controversy about the census. It goes all the way back to the beginning when George Washington thought there was an undercount. And this always seems to come up, the count. Why? Well, the constitutional purpose is for the allocation of seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, which in turn affects the Electoral College votes. But there's something else driving the train, and that is that Congress has freighted this with the distribution of money. 
And often the distribution of money is far more important to those who are concerned about money. And so virtually every 10 years we get litigation about the census. In fact, last time around, David Rifkin and I, not suing for money, but suing for representation of the state of Louisiana, which lost a seat due to the way we thought it shouldn't have been counted. Anyway, you can be sure that the litigation over the census is not over. It will continue for quite a while. Okay, in this case, the case that went to the Supreme Court came from a New York federal court. There was another case in Maryland as well, but the main case was, was in New York. And the issue is, could the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, add the question of, are you a citizen to the census? That was the question. How could that be controversial? Well, there were a number of legal arguments made, but essentially what was at issue was a strategic move in terms of litigation, which is all too complicated for our home audience. Needless to say, the case went up first to the Supreme Court back in November of last year. And then it came back for a decision on the merits on the last day of the term when the Supreme Court left town. As lawyers know, they always drop the bombs right before they leave town, and they did that again. In, in the case itself, you had New York, California, a number of states, mayors, counties, and 100, at least 184 nonprofit groups suing and making various claims, both about enumeration, about what's called the Administrative Procedures Act, and also equal protection. Ultimately, the decision doesn't, it comes down on the Administrative Procedures Act, a very boring topic about which you'll hear something. The process continued, and then after that, the president responded by saying, we're gonna account citizens. The question was, how do you do that? The Justice Department was facing the issue that the ballot, not ballots, but the documents needed to go to printing, basically July 1. And so there was this struggle over how to deal with this because the Supreme Court, in a decision that only a law professor could love, had such a convoluted result it said, on the one hand, yes, normally, the Secretary of Commerce, who oversees the Census Bureau, could add this question. But he didn't give the proper justification. Now, they didn't say, theoretically, it wasn't possible for them to go back down to the lower court and come back again with a different reason. But the clock was running. And there was sure to be plenty of litigation because there had already been plenty of litigation. This is a decision in which only one justice, Chief Justice Roberts, had the entire opinion. That is, there were four on one side that agreed with him that yes, you could ask the question. There were four on one side that said, but no, you can't ask the question right now based on what you've told us. That's why it was so confusing to so many people. That's the it is. I'm remarks. supposed to tell him what so I'm So now you've got it. it's six minutes. As now he's going to time me. Okay. To, to make your argumentative remarks. Okay. I call him that. After President Trump announced that we were going to ask the citizenship question, anyway, there was a lot of back and forth, as would normally be the case between lawyers in the White House, lawyers in the Justice Department, the Commerce Department, et cetera. All of this is going on. And finally, they realized, as if they probably knew ahead of time, it is a practical matter. You're not going to be able to ask the question. There's not time to go back to the court and litigate this thing all the way up. It just wouldn't, wasn't going to happen. But many people who weren't deeply involved in the issue said at the end, it's over. They thought, you know, there will be no citizenship information wrong on both counts. It's not over. 
it's not over. Why? What Secretary Ross did was to find out in the process critical information. What was that information? Well, the people in the Census Bureau were opposed from the beginning to his proposal. And they offered every other kind of way to get the information. And what they revealed was they already had 88% of the information, which came as a surprise to many people. So what he said, well, we will have both the question and what are called the administrative records. Well, why not just the administrative records? They weren't complete at the time. That was a critical part, not complete. So what happens after that? What happens after that is that when the case comes back, it is now going forward on the basis that was argued by the staff that was resisting Secretary Ross. So now, in a way, they've got what they wanted, but they didn't get what they want. Why? The big problem for Ross and the department was you have to negotiate with the other departments to get the information that was lacking. Without that information, you wouldn't have a complete picture of citizens versus aliens. The key in the president's executive order is that he orders the completion of those records and that the departments cooperate with the Commerce Department to give them this information. That means if all that information comes out by a year from now, basically, we will know how many citizens and non-citizens primarily aliens, but there are non-citizens who are permanent legal residents. It's not just about illegal aliens. There are all kinds of foreign students, embassy staffs, and other people who are counted in the census and represented in your Congress. Very few people even know that. What's the takeaway? It was not a waste of time for Secretary Ross to do what he did. It opened up a pile of information that the bureaucrats knew about, but the politicals didn't know about. It was probably accidental that they gave them the information. So we all ought to be very thankful to Secretary Ross for what he's done. Now the other things in the executive order are that it notes that the 2016 case Evanwell, left open the question of whether states could redistrict state legislative districts based on total population or voter population. So you can guarantee that that will be a litigated issue, and this information coming from the Commerce Department will be essential to that. The other issue is regarding a lawsuit brought by the state of Alabama because they anticipate that they will lose a congressional seat because of the counting of aliens in the, the redistribution of seats. This is the case that David and I litigated back 10 years ago regarding Louisiana. We didn't get very far, unfortunately. So am I, I with him my six minutes? Yes, you have, um, you have another minute. Oh, I do. <laughs> That's never happened to me before. Why is this important? One of the things that Secretary Ross discovered when they got the administrative records, they matched those against the citizenship question on the American Community Survey. What happened over the years, the citizenship question migrated over to this other form. This form is sent out on a rolling basis, but only to about 3.5 million people. And when that question is asked, it turns out when you compare the administrative records, there is somewhere between 28 and 30% false answers. People claiming to be citizens who are not citizens. Ah, the, the Census Bureau estimated back in 2012 that there were between 11 and 12 million illegal aliens in the country. Their numbers were based on a false estimate of the false responses. Based on the new information, 
it is very likely that there is at least double that amount, or at least 25 million, not 11 or 12 million. The number is false. And independently of this, there was a Yale study came out, which is mentioned in the executive order, that estimates that there are somewhere between 16 and 29 million illegal aliens in the country. This is information that the American people deserve to have. Thank you very much. <laughs> David? I'll probably, in the interest of time, uh, remain seated. Uh, I'll be very brief since uh, my good friend and uh, colleague, Professor Baker, laid out uh, the big picture here. Let me just say that uh, the citizenship question appears to be one of those issues that unfortunately gets tied up in politics as almost everything these days, and uh, it's, it's not surprising, but a little depressing because, as, as Professor Baker pointed out, this has been a continuous feature on all, in the census context from the beginning of, <laughs> of our republic all the way from 1950 when, as John put it, this question migrated to a sample of, uh, uh, of the forms. And um, I mean, up until recently, I cannot imagine anybody would have seriously argued that this information cannot be collected, leaving aside all the Administrative Procedures Act aside, and we'll maybe talk about it a little bit, but I would just say that uh, I, I, I certainly agree with the dissent in, uh, in the New York case uh, by the four justices. Unfortunately, without the chief, otherwise it would have been the majority opinion that, uh, that while this rulemaking was admittedly untidy, uh, it did not uh, constitute a sufficient violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. And one can also argue, uh, as uh, Justice Alito points out in his separate dissent, that given the language of a Census Act, it was pretty much committed to the Secretary's discretion and therefore is not renew reviewable judicially at all. But what I wanted to say is, uh, is as follows. There, there are other alternative ways to go forward. We, we're probably done as far as putting the actual citizenship question on the census forms for purposes of 2020. Somewhat uh, regrettable in my opinion, but, uh, uh, but the bureaucratic institutional realities and the timelines were as Professor Baker described. What I would like to see is, is to see if we can resolve this question on the most fundamental level, whether or not it is legitimate to ask such question. I actually would think, as I'll tell you in a, in a second, it's not only legitimate, it's constitutionally compelled but I would like to see um, this administration put forward this question for purposes of 2030 census. And I can say to me, that's kind of crazy. It's many years uh, left between now and 2030, but I don't know any principle of administrative law or any other legal impairment that prevents an agency from engaging in the structure and rulemaking that lays out uh, how they're going to tackle a given issue. It happens all the time, as some of my friends here know in the uh, world of environmental law, for example, when EPA says how we're going to approach certain types of, of issues that are going to arise, like risk assessments and whatnot. So uh, the way to proceed would be to have the present issue the executive order that would direct the Secretary of, of Commerce and specifically the, uh, the Census Bureau to engage in the rulemaking, can be a pretty abbreviated rulemaking, but indicates how they're going to proceed with a 2030 census. And so we don't need to be uh, dealing with APA issues uh, on the eve of a 2030 census. I'd like to say that maybe the political environment would moderate by that point in time, but that would be uh, that'd be probably an unduly optimistic view. Now, why do I think, and that's a fairly new argument that has been, not been put on the table, why do I think that uh, asking the question about citizenship is not only constitutionally permissible, and by the way, we do have five justices, including the chief, that, that said that in, uh, in the New York uh, case. Uh, Why well, I think it's constitutionally compelled, I think it's pretty straightforward. If you look at Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, uh, that is one of the uh, post-Civil War amendments, it makes clear that uh, one of the ways in ensuring that states do not abridge suffrage improperly, which is to say deny the right uh, eligible citizens to vote, uh, in addition to the language in Section 1 that, of course, provides the basis uh, to prohibit any state practices that, uh, that engage in discrimination. Section 2 says that if you actually do that and you deny suffrage to a, a portion of your uh, 
of your citizens. Now it talks about male citizens 21 years old, but that's not, that's not a, a criticism of, oh, I've gotten some criticism along those lines because that's what the, popula the citizenship baseline was at that point in time was obviously changed. But basically you're going to lose your, uh, or diminish your representation in the House and presumably in the Electoral College by, by the same percentage. So if you prevent your 10% of your citizens, eligible citizens from voting, uh, you would lose 10% of, uh, of your representation in the House. Uh, one of the interesting points here, by the way, that the whole math makes no sense unless you assume that your House representation is actually based upon the citizenship baseline and not everybody uh, present here. I've gotten some criticism of this, which I think is essentially untenable, but we may be able to tackle it, including the notion that this is an archaic language, which is kind of funny to me since uh, our Constitution does not go out of style, and the fact that uh, the 14th Amendment is, uh, is the crown jewel of most of our civil rights laws uh, suggests to me, Section 1 in particular, but Section 2 should be given equal weight, and as I would tell you a bit later on, actually, the Supreme Court has dealt with the viability of Section 2 once uh, in the not-too-distant past. So I think that's, that would be a good way forward. If I can resolve this question on, on the merits and not worry about APA and, and set the process in place for the 2030 Census. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Neil, feel free to sit or stand as you may prefer. I think I'm the only lazy one now. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Once uh, Professor Baker got up, I figured I pretty much had to try to represent my side. So um, let me just uh, have a few comments uh, that I wanted to make about this, which is, um, look, uh, Mr. Rifkin asked the question, why would anybody object to a citizenship question? Doesn't that seem pretty obvious and the kind of thing you'd really want to know the answer to? The difficulty with the citizenship you have to remember the constitutional provision about enumeration only talks about counting the people in the country. There a practice had developed of asking additional questions that the government for other reasons thought be useful to know the answer to. Actually in 1950 they decided there were so many additional questions that were getting asked that actually counting the people in the country was starting to become a problem. So they cut way back and this is referenced in uh, the Chief Justice's opinion. And so that's fundamentally the, the issue this became a problem about is particularly the experts at the Census Bureau, but experts a number of places, but particularly the experts at the Census Bureau concluded that it, particularly in this environment, I think the Chief Justice doesn't do enough with this, that particularly in this environment with this attention, with this president announcing there are gonna be massive raids to remove people out of the country, I, I, I think that raid actually resulted in arresting 35 people. Um, but in this atmosphere, that asking that question would suppress the, the response generally and interfere with the constitutional requirement to count the number of people in the country. That's what this whole dispute was about. And it's just to remind you, the constitutional provision is count the number of people. It's not, it's not the ancillary questions that, have, that people have decided, since we're going to ask questions anyway every 10 years, why don't we throw some uh, others on, which it has been uh, sort of pretty, uh, pretty common. Let me just make a, a couple other comments. Um, obviously, uh, Chief Justice Roberts has come under a lot of uh, criticism for the decision that he rendered in this case. Um, a lot of people, including me, think of him as an institutionalist, and frankly, I think he thought to himself, that in this case, you know, those of you who are lawyers in the room know there's an old expression which is bad facts make bad uh, law or bad uh, cases. The problem was essentially that Secretary Ross had given testimony under oath about where this citizenship question came from. And he described that it was asked of him by the Department of Justice and they're the ones who really wanted it. As the facts came forward, that turned out not to be true. Um, and almost shockingly not true, um, not to overstate this, but I think he's probably hoping that President Trump is reelected, so the statute of limitations runs on a particular potential review of the truthfulness of his testimony under oath in front of Congress, but it was pretty shockingly not true. 
and it caused really into question the entire motivation. And, I th and, and the other thing, you'll all remember that in the weeks before the decision, more evidence came out and frankly, I think the Chief Justice had decided that the facts, if anything, were even going to get worse on this issue. And although uh, uh, he has a whole section of the opinion about uh, deference and significant deference, and we'll probably come back to that, that at least on this question, he, 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 could, he was not willing to defer because he called the decision by Secretary Ross contrived a distraction and uh, made it quite clear that he didn't believe the decision. And, and again, we'll probably come back to this, but it's one thing to defer. It's another thing to defer to a decision that the courts have decided is not actually the decision that the, um, that the uh, decision maker was really making. Let me just make one or two other points before I get my, uh, get my note, and I'm sure we'll come back to it. I actually think this uh, section two of the 14th Amendment uh, argument is quite, and I've been struggling with the right word, um, Maybe I'll stay with far-fetched. Um, if you remember, the 14th Amendment did not actually provide that African Americans could vote. That's the 15th Amendment. So the way the 14th Amendment dealt with this issue was to say, states, you do whatever you want, but if there are males over the age of 21 in your state that you're precluding from voting, you will lose representation as a purport, in, sort of in a proportion to how many people in your state have been deprived of the right to vote. <laughs> so that's what, that's what Section 2 is really about, and that's what it really was intended to do. And if you think about it, this provision is a remedy in the event that a state is found to have deprived votes to a significant percentage of its population. It hasn't happened. It didn't even happen in Reconstruction. In Reconstruction, the states did not deny the right to vote to African Americans. What they did was put into place various uh, barriers, but did not outright ban the right to vote. And so this has never been uh, implemented. I can't imagine that there is a state that currently is contemplating banning the right to vote to uh, citizens over the age of now 18. Interesting dispute about living constitution, whether the male in 21 has survived uh, the 14th Amendment section two or not. But the notion that he would, uh, that, that, that Mr. Rifkin would do is, was go straight to the remedy before he found a violation. So you would ask this of everybody in every state, even if at some point Maine decided it was going to deprive the right to vote to a significant portion of its population, which obviously is never going to happen. So, so the problem with this is that you're going to the remedy, and it seems to me that this is a pretext that would make even Secretary Ross uh, blush. <coughs> and for the final point I just want to make is and I think Justice Thomas does a fair amount of this, and I think this is a, a fascinating place where these cases sort of collide, which is, which is the notion of presumption of regularity. And presumption of regularity is a concept that typically applies to administrations and typically applies to presidents. And I think that what, the, the, what a number of the cases that we've seen in the travel ban case, it went in favor of the administration, uh, in this case, it went against the administration because although it's a presumption, it's not a conclusive presumption. There'll be a, um, the military transgender case will come up. It'll be interesting to see what happens in those situations. But as Professor Goldsmith has said uh, from time to time at Harvard, uh, it's interesting. This is an administration where the president actually says what he thinks, and um, and uh, then the lawyers are left to clean up uh, the the you know the uh, battlefield afterwards. And so I think we're going to continue to see this issue essentially play out in a whole series of cases. We've already seen it in two, and I think we have a bunch more to come. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm going to ask questions to the panelists in the order in which they spoke, and then after the first panelist addresses a question, the others should feel free to. David, would you like to take a few seconds before I start that to respond on section two of the 14th Amendment? Sure, I, uh, I heard the same uh, arguments uh, made by a lot of law professors. Uh, Neil made them with slightly more litigation finance, but I would say those arguments are untenable for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that, yes, I understand what the 15th Amendment does, what Section 1 of the 14th Amendment does, but it does not vitiate Section 2, and it's not a question of remedy. If you look at the language of that section, 
it specifically talks about abridging not the right of, of suffrage to all residents because all residents uh, do not have a right of suffrage. We're talking about citizens and yes, male citizens because that was, the, as I said, the citizenship baseline. You cannot possibly be in a position to do that which has to be done in a situation where a violation occurs without having a citizenship number. But don't take my word for it about the fact that the section is viable. It's actually an interesting detail. Section 2 specifically allows you to deny suffrage to folks uh, um, deny or abridge folks who are guilty of participation in the rebellion or of a crime. In 1974, the Supreme Court considered this issue in the case that I mentioned in my op-ed piece called the Richardson versus Ramirez. It was a 6-3 decision written by Chief Justice Rehnquist. And the question there was, that, yes, there are citizens, including in California, amazingly enough, that are uh, abridged their suffrage rights and they're called former felons. And you had people bring a challenge to that policy claiming that it violated what? An equal protection clause of what? Of section one of the 14th Amendment, six justices of the Supreme Court rejected this and in the process of rejecting this challenge, basically said that, look, something that's explicitly allowed by Section 2 cannot possibly violate Section 1, otherwise you assume the framers wrote the 14th Amendment as it were of itself. But also, importantly enough, in the process, they decisively rejected the argument made by the free dissenting justices that Section 2 was somehow archaic and underutilized and really was kind of a political afterthought, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just read you one sentence. Nor can we accept the respondent's argument that because Section 2 was made part of an amendment largely for the incident of political exigency rather than for a violation which it bored of other sections of amendment, we must not look to it for guidance in interpreting it. It is as much part of an amendment as any of our other sections, and how it became part of an amendment is less important for what it says and what it means. Six free decision, ladies and gentlemen, pretty, pretty modern. Thank, thank you, David. Um, Question uh, for you in the first instance, John. And I gather there may be a problem with your microphone. See, see if it's working. Mine? No, uh, John's. I guess yeah. yeah. Um, President Trump, in announcing his executive order, said on July 12th, quote, some states may want to draw state and local legislative districts based upon the voter eligible population, end quote. The New York Times characterized this as the clearest statement yet that his administration's ultimate goal in obtaining data on citizenship was to eliminate illegal immigrants and other non-citizens from the population base used to draw political boundaries, a long-standing dream in some Republican circles. Is this, John, the actual reason or the main reason, do you think, behind the whole effort to add the citizenship to the question? Question, I'm sorry, the citizenship question to the census? Well, I can't speak to what President Trump was thinking or not. I know what David and I did 10 years ago. It seems to me preposterous that you would count not only aliens, whether they're here legally or illegally, but that you would count members of embassy staffs. The, the Census Bureau says we count everybody but tourists. In the last census, they counted a guy in a deportation jail, and he was being deported that day. These are statisticians gone wild. In an upcoming op-ed I'll have, they even have denied the whole concept of citizenship, which I'll explain later. They don't understand the Constitution, and they may have lawyers who don't understand it. So for instance, Neil and the Census Bureau use the wrong terminology. And when it comes to the Constitution now, terminology is destiny, it's everything. So they say the enumeration clause requires the counting of all people. No, it doesn't. It requires the counting of numbers. Numbers, why would they say numbers? The word numbers was an abbreviation at the last draft of the Constitution of number of inhabitants. In the last draft, which was merely stylistic, was not to change what they had agreed to. 
and the first census, and others used, count the number of inhabitants. And if you go to the 14th Amendment, as David was talking about, in that same section two, after it talks about respective numbers, then it goes to male inhabitants. Well, back then, most inhabitants were here legally, and they weren't going back to Europe anytime soon. There wasn't plane service. The issue of who is an inhabitant is critical. Legal inhabitants are not foreign students. Legal inhabitants are not embassy staffs. Legal inhabitants are not aliens who park themselves here. They are not legally inhabiting the United States. That's the issue. David, question. If I can just add one, one second. There's actually, uh, in addition to points that John made, uh, there was an original public meaning, if you look at the British practice that goes back maybe 100 years before the founding, that defined what an inhabitant meant in the context of, again, the British practice, and it's somebody who had appropriate ties to the political community in which that person could reside. And I mean, I, I don't have time, but a lot of it actually had to do with welfare because different different counties uh, in Britain were not interested in having neighboring county dump on them people who needed public support. So the, the, the framers understood very well what inhabitants meant, uh, and. It, it is just, but look, to me, that's something that remains to be litigated in the post even well world. Um, I happen to think the litigation would come out a certain way. Others may disagree, maybe Neil disagrees with me, but the notion that we cannot even get the numbers to me is, is just kind of risable. Question for Neil. Would it be a good idea or a bad one to draw state and local election districts based on eligible voter population as Justice Trump suggested, I'm sorry, uh, President Trump suggested uh, uh, maybe that would be a good idea. And also, would it be constitutional to do that? So I think that uh, people talked about the case from a couple years ago when this issue, when this issue was addressed. So, so I, I agree with Mr. Rifkin that a lot of this just has to be litigated. Just to respond briefly to Mr. Rifkin. Um, so people in the country have been the standard by which the census has been taken for census after census after census. So this is another new argument that's uh, part of a political uh, uh, argument. I get that, that's fine. It's obviously, as uh, Mr. Rifkin said, that's gonna end up being, uh, being litigated. But if, as Chief Justice Roberts said in his uh, opinion, upholding the census question on the APA side, uh, if history matters, then history ought to matter on, on uh, however you think about it. Um, on the, but, but you've asked me a slightly different question, Stuart, which is, which is sort of the policy question, I think. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Um, I think it's probably a bad idea. Um, there, there are um, representatives represent people in their districts uh, regardless of why they're there. And so I, I, I think it's probably from a policy viewpoint uh, a bad idea, uh, but, but that's, uh, that's sort of my analysis of that. And I know others have a different view, and I know it's a pretty strong uh, argument point by, uh, um, by conservatives. And I, I suspect uh, that our other two panelists may want to speak to that question specifically, good idea or bad idea, and constitutional or unconstitutional uh, to, um, uh, count only eligible voters in terms of districting. In state and local districting, federal is a different question, I think. I would say the following, it's kind of interesting because Neil mentioned in the context of the, the argument that uh, having this question in the census on short forms would depress the response rates. He pointed out that, you know, because the obvious rejoinder would have been, well, we've been doing it till 1950, so what, everything has been unconstitutional uh, practice prior to that in the sense that it depressed turnout, but no, he, he quite carefully cabined the fact situation by pointing out that it's because of Trump's idiosyncrasies and the you know, threat environment that he generated. So we have to understand then that the same argument applies uh, to a situation of what is the baseline you're using. Look, for most of our history, everybody in this country was legal because Congress did not pass an elaborate immigration uh, 
uh, statutes that you know, said that some people can come in, some people cannot come in. So during that period of our history, it, everybody who was present here were, were indeed inhabitants, should have been counted. That changed, of course, that changed um, in, in, in modern times, but again, the question on the table is not whether or not, you cannot answer the question whether you should count people who are not citizens without looking at the, the kind of asymmetries and the kind of numbers we have. And I would say this, I wonder why Neil thinks that that's okay to have wide asymmetries in the distribution of illegal aliens in this country who tend to favor states like California, for example, that tremendously augments Forget about the benefits they receive in terms of uh, federal largesse. That's really an appropriations type issue, but in terms of political power. One of the great issues at the founding was how to balance the power of different states, large states, small states. You know, at more time, we can talk about Virginia plan and Connecticut plan and all the debates about why need bicameral legislation and two senators. But let's just say that the framers were very much concerned about the representation in the House and the Electoral College. And in a situation where you have dramatic swings, where states like Louisiana uh, or Alabama uh, and Ohio are losing seats, and California is gaining seats, largely because, because they're losing quite a bit of a, of a citizen population going to places like Arizona, they're losing seats because of illegal aliens, and, and they also are making themselves attractive to illegal aliens, which again is, you know, their policy choice. But I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, there's something fundamentally wrong from a structural separation of powers perspective when we have now a mechanism where one group of states can artificially inflate their political power at the expense of other states. That question, by the way, has never been considered by the Supreme Court. The context for question of whether or not you count eligible citizens or old people has been in the context of one person, one vote, which is an important issue, but it's never been debated in the context of structural separation of powers. And that's again new. It did not exist by and large for a long period in our history, and then for many decades thereafter it just wasn't that important. But if, if John Baker is right, and we're talking about a baseline of 15, 18, 20 million people, who are distributed very asymmetrically. Again, if it were sprinkled throughout all the states, it wouldn't make any difference. Distributed very asymmetrically, that puts a serious stress on, on, on structural separation of powers, which is the core element of our constitutional architecture. And I, I, I don't know how one can take it off a table. So, uh, Stuart, may I respond? Go ahead, sure. So look, as Justice Kagan has said, uh, we're all textualists now. Um, and if the question is about apportionment among the states, I think the Constitution, which is not a policy document that we get to decide we don't really like anymore without amending it, says in Section 2, representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state. Counting the whole number of persons in each state. It was the whole number was designed to get rid of the three-fifth uh, provision that had been in the Constitution before. I think the, the, the issue about apportioning state and local legislative districts and the like, that is open under the Constitution. I would argue that in light of the explicit language of the Constitution, which we're not allowed to decide, we just don't like today, this uh, issue has been resolved. And uh, that's the reason I think that, that um, that's where we are. On this question, I recognize on the state and local question that's not resolved by this, and I expect, as I say, there was a case a couple of years ago, and I think in Texas, if I'm remembering right, I didn't read it in preparation for today, so it's not the top of my head. 2016. Uh, well, Evan Will. Yeah, well, I thank you for that. I forgot the name, but I remember it was a couple of years old. Um, so I think there'll probably continue to be litigation over over that issue. Interesting, interesting if you... Um, think about it. I mean, I wasn't a big fan, frankly, of the gerrymandering case, but you know, you, you could end up in a uh, sort of a situation where red states and blue states sort of do different things in their within the state uh, allocation. And so this is an argument that can go both directions depending on whether you're in a red state or a blue state. 
Just 30 Thank seconds. You. Well, you may David, be right. uh, David, I think John's, Sorry, it's okay. John's turn, and then I have a question for John after he okay. says what he's about okay. to say. I'll repeat to Neil, numbers is short for numbers of inhabitants, that's one thing. On the question of whether total population or voters, this is very interesting because if you're an American citizen living outside of the United States but not connected to the military or our government, you are not counted. But if we start going by voters in a state, at least for the state district, you will be counted. Now, what justifies that? What you don't realize is that this independent Census Bureau is not so independent. You can look at it and see the political influences and their advisory committees and the arguments about where people should be counted. And they make arbitrary decisions that may be conducive to counting, but they're not conducive to understanding citizenship. It's not just that matter. They say, we will count you in the place where you normally reside, okay? If you are legally a citizen of one state, but you happen on that day or regularly to live somewhere else, you're gonna get counted in that other state even though you're voting over here. They do that to students too. If you have college age students, you will experience what I experienced at the last census. They see the age of the students, they call you up and they say, I see you have college age students. Are they living at home? Well, no, they're in another state. Bingo, they move to that other state whether or not they have been legally residing in that state in the sense of evidence by driver's license and in addition to driver's license, voting. Yeah, then they would become a citizen. Now this I wanna to say to all the parents out there who have students in state schools in other states where they will not give you in-state tuition. Here's the argument you make, and plaintiff's lawyers, please listen. The argument is that the reason a state can deny you in-state tuition is because, after all, citizens of the state are paying taxes, and you're coming in from out of state, and you're imposing costs. Guess what? By counting you in that state, and I can tell you the colleges do it aggressively, they're going to get at least $1,200 ahead for the 10 years of that. So, and you can look down on the numbers. This is ironic. California has, at least on public colleges, a net deficit. California could pick up lots of dough by suing on this very question of counting citizens in the wrong place. We're gonna have wonderful litigation for a long time, and we need it. We need it to expose the corruption of the Census Bureau. John, can I ask you a, a different question? And I'm returning to a point Neil made earlier. Uh, three federal ju trial judges ruled that Commerce Secretary Wilbur Wa Ross was not being truthful in his sworn testimony before Congress that he decided to add the citizenship question solely in response to a Justice Department request for data to help enforce the Voting Rights Act. And Chief Justice Roberts, it seems to me, agreed. Uh, put bluntly, was Wilbur Ross's explanation a lie in part two? If so, would it have been appropriate for the Supreme Court to dismiss the lie as too insignificant to warrant requiring further process before allowing Ross to add the citizenship question? Anybody who's worked in a department of government knows that secretaries don't do this research. <laughs> They've got lots of lawyers and staff to do things. Staff send them information. They rely on that information. And I can tell you, because Louisiana did it, a number of attorneys general sent letters to the department asking that this information be available because they have to defend against litigation which always follows the census. Now, Neil talked about motivation, and what they, the argument was basically that this administration doesn't care about the rights of people, so this has got to be a phony argument. I don't care whether you care about the rights or not, if you think that. As a matter of defense, lawyers need this information. It's not a frivolous thing. Neil mentioned motivation. If we start parsing the motivation 
not only of members of administrative branches. What we're saying is that they can't have various motivations, they can't have multiple motivations, and there can't be political motivations. We have to leave this all to the technocrats. And of course, they have no motivations, right? They're robots. Neil, um, a somewhat related question, and then please address it, David, if, if you, I know you had a point you wanted to make. The dissenting liberal justices in Trump versus Hawaii and many other commentators thought that the reason offered for the Trump travel ban was pretext and that the real reason was anti-Muslim animus. Why did the administration win in that case and lose in the sentence case on this sort of similar pretext issue? So I think in, in my response, I'll also just pick up what, what Professor Baker mentioned because I think it's kind of relative, relevant to the answer. I think the travel ban case actually illustrates the degree of deference that the court was willing to give to the administration. There was significant evidence out of the president's mouth of anti-Muslim animus through the campaign, even into his administration. But in, but in addition to the president, th there was substantial work by res respected other members of the administration, and I think there was a general sense that th the process worked. And whatever the president may have been saying and whatever his motivation may have been, the process generally worked. I actually think that I sort of always uh, sort of chuckled, you know, Sally Yates was fired for not defending the first travel ban, and two weeks later the Department of Justice abandoned the first tra uh, travel ban and decided it couldn't defend it either, and went to travel ban two, and then ultimately travel ban three, and, uh, and by the time they got to three, I, I teach a, a, sort of a lecture at Harvard Law School, and I told my students, look, I don't know how travel ban three is gonna come out, because it can't be that you can never sort of dissipate the taint. And so, um, but, but that's, and I actually think that case should have been argued. I never thought the Chief Justice would find the President of the United States a, a racist, and that I think it should have been argued on the standard of review, the deference issue, and, and all that, and not really on whether his statements were racist or not. The arguer, Neil Katyal, fantastic lawyer, super smart, but I think that was misconceived. I think the problem, the problem with the census case, and if the facts had been the way Professor Baker just did, did it, it may have been a different issue, but the problem was, it wasn't like there was an articulated rationale which was logical and one that wasn't logical or that people can't have mixed motives or can't have political motives because all that's gonna happen. What you had is a secretary who came up with an entire story. He said the story was his sole motivation. I think that was his language. Uh, in order to respond to a request from the Department of Justice that had to do with the uh, necessity of defending voting rights cases, or litigating voting rights cases, I shouldn't say uh, defending, whichever, so sort of litigating voting rights cases, and it just didn't turn out to be true. And so the whole issue of review of administrative actions has got to be fundamental, if fundamentally the administrative agency has to say the reason for its decision or else the entire judicial review process turns out just to be a joke because if it's sort of whatever they can come up with after the fact or whatever the Department of Justice can come up with in connection with litigation, that's not actually review. And so I think, I think this was an example of the Chief Justice saying, look, I mean, I think he fundamentally agree with what Justice Alito and Justice Thomas said but I think his position was, that may be true, but that's not this case. This case is someone who came up with a rationale. It turned out not to be a valid rationale. He said it was his sole rationale, and that's just asking too much of this court to defer to it. I think that's what was going on. I think that's the difference between the two cases. Otherwise, there's one more sentence. I know everybody wants to go after me, which is fine, uh, big boy. Um, uh, John had a point that, yeah, I'm it, sorry, it, were it, you done? I'm sorry, <laughs> Did I, I interrupted you. I, I thought you were finished. No, I, 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 I'll quit. Well, okay. Uh, it's about time for audience questions, but first, first John has something to add. If, if you go back to the March a memo that Secretary Ross issued, it's, that's not in there is his sole motivation. I know he made that statement, but that's not in the memo that way. Uh, just to show the high degree of collegiality here, I actually agree with Neil's uh, points regarding the ability to draw the difference between the travel ban cases in this case, yes, they did clean up things several times and even the worst kind of taint dissipates. 
But look, uh, frankly, we spend a lot of time talking about the APA issue. I would say the dissent by the four justices makes makes an excellent point. Uh, to me, again, the, the, the more fundamental question really is what we should be looking for as a country relative to obtaining the information that would inform a whole lot of debates. And by the way, we don't have time to get into this, but I would just say with respect to Neil, the whole point that uh, Professor Baker and I alluded to relative to inhabitant, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I mean, people have written briefs and, and law review articles on the subject. Uh, so it, it, it's hard to do justice to this. But again, getting the numbers, uh, getting the information, and having the litigation turn out as it may, I think it's probably about as a reasonable approach as possible. And, and there's something suspicious to me with respect, ladies and gentlemen, of people who are so stubbornly eager not to have the information, because that's not, that's not a usual practice in a democracy. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that's Neil's position, but Cory Booker, for example, introduced legislation that would affirmatively bar the federal government from providing any kind of information about citizenship of the states, whether it comes from this actual enumeration or it comes from other federal uh, governments generated documents. Is that a good thing that we should be hiding that kind of information? I don't think so. Stuart, can I just have sort of one more sure. comment? And not really. A bit and then if anyone in the audience has questions, please have them ready. What actually struck me is in some ways, and I don't, this is not particularly political, and so I don't know if my colleagues will agree with me or not agree with me on this, but what struck me actually about the Chief Justice's opinion on the APA issues, actually, was just how much deference he would grant uh, agency heads, which is, and, and significantly more than I think actually courts of appeals typically grant to the EPA and sort of various other decisions. He, I mean, he, there was an enormous amount of deference to decisions by the secretary, even in the face of, a, of really very little evidence, if any evidence, supporting his decision. And yet, the Chief Justice basically said, look, it's his decision to make. Uh, he didn't agree. Nobody except Alito thought it was not re uh, reviewable, as I remember. But it basically, uh, he was quite deferential. And I sort of wonder, well, anyway, I don't know if your reaction, but, I, but it, it was a little schizophrenic because hugely deferential, more deferential than I actually thought the law was until the opinion came out on the APA decisions by an agency head, and then obviously um, uh, unwilling to go uh, uh, as far as he ultimately went. But I would have said that he was more deferential. And, and look, I don't know what will happen, but there will eventually be another Democratic president. And that language you know, is, is there. And uh, we'll see what happens when that, when that takes place. Question, audience questions? Yes, sir. I, I agree and at the cynical level. I uh, probably the same with Neil. I practice a lot of administrative law for a living. It would be more work for me if this was the beginning of a change in administrative law where you start scrutinizing what's pretextual. I suspect that this is one time only. I suspect I agree with Neil. The, 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 the rhetoric of the Chief Justice's opinion was, was all fine. The application was wanting. I think in some ways it's like NFIB. It's a, it's a one one ride only pony. Uh, but again, it, 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 it doesn't excite me nearly as much, frankly, as, as, as there are issues involved here. But yes, I, I, I think what's interesting is that, uh, talking about lack of deference, uh, 
I talked about the fact that five justices do believe in asking a citizen question, even in the current environment that is impacted by the political trends we face, society is constitutionally and statutorily legitimate. I don't think anybody who's read the opinion can disagree with it. But we do have four justices because if you look carefully, parse Justice Breyer's opinion, he's basically saying that it can never be done. The reason it can never be done is because uh, of the uh, suppression of response rates and the fact that in his opinion, a uh, consistent with a technocratic view of a Census Bureau, it's never necessary. So uh, we have four justices who think it can never be, it is never permissible under the Census Act. They obviously have not grappled with a section two of the 14th Amendment argument. So it's interesting. If, if I were Justice Roberts, I would have at least tried to trade, to have a better trade as he's done in NFIB where I would have said, yeah. I'm gonna kill this on APA grounds, but why don't you get at least seven justices for the proposition that's inherently permissible, which is what happened in the NFIB case. Sorry, I'm using jargon, but I'm talking about challenge to the uh, constitutionality of individual insurance purchase mandate. So it was not a very good, it was not a very good deal in my opinion. It has nothing to do with the law. Gentlemen, why don't you ask your questions the in the order? The Constitution speaks about persons in reference to counting, uh, obviously, slaves, although they, they don't use the, the term. Um, and I'm wondering, this is purely a historical question, uh, whether there was any controversy over who should be counted as a slave and whether, for example, plantation owners would say, uh, I have a thousand Freeman working for me uh, to, to bolster the number of uh, uh, people under uh, uh, who could be claimed for, for representation. And it comes to mind because after the Civil War, of course, when slaves were, fr slaves were freed, then the Southern representation increased, which is quite a bounty for losing a war. So do, does anyone know anything about the counting of of slaves in uh, Annabellum era for representation purposes? I don't know specifically about the, how the count was carried out. For a long time it was done by marshals. And I don't know when they switched from that and, and to what extent and what methods they used. But, you know, in Article One, it provides not only about slaves and freemen, it's also for for others as well, according to the respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to a service for a term of years. Is that what you're referring to, the, those bound for? Well, the three-fifths clause. Well, no, that's after it. But, but the whole point was, it's about representation. And everyone who was an inhabitant was to be represented, except slaves were only represented as three-fifths of persons. Madison addresses this in the Federalist. Right. The South wanted them counted as persons. Mm -hmm. The South wanted that, real irony. The, the North said no, they shouldn't be counted at all because the South considers them property. The census has been disputed from the beginning regarding who should be represented. The key is there's representation even if only three-fifths from the beginning, there's representation for others who are servants. There were relatively few citizens compared to, to today. Remember, the whole concept of citizenship was new. You know, it goes back to ancient times. Today, we've lost the concept of citizen. We, we equate resident with citizen. So for instance, people refer to Chinese citizens. They're not citizens. They're inhabitants. Yeah, but they're not citizens. Citizen means a person engaged in the political body who has a say. That's what a citizen is. Just one quick point. I also do not know it's actually, um, I don't know of any research on this issue, but it's interesting to show you again uh, the lack of this certitude that we hear, uh, that these are just all persons. There's specific textual exemption in Article One, for Indians not taxed. Now, why is that? They're not their persons. It's because they owed, at least for a long time, their allegiance to a different body polity. Because we're talking about dependent nations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, again, 
there, if we had several hours, we can delve into the question of a British practice and the original public meaning, and as John alluded to, the, the terse reference to numbers and what happened at the committee of style level and what it did, but that's probably not useful purposes of today. All I'm saying there's a lot more here than just fairly straightforward, well, if you're here, we're going to count you for these purposes. Yeah. Can, can we I just jump in? I, I just go ahead. But we I, I really didn't understand what John said, and I just want to make clear that I didn't understand it. The, the Constitution says anybody born in the United States is a citizen. I don't know this involved in the... In the if they're born. Yes. That's different from coming in. Well, or naturalized. I, you said Chinese are not citizens. Anybody born in the no, United in States China, is a citizen. In China, they refer to their people okay, well, as citizens. They're, they're not are, citizens. They're inhabitants. Our Constitution doesn't actually cover China, but that was useful. That was an you. example to show how Thank people you. have diluted the term citizen. It means something. It means more than simply being a person. It means more than being a, a resident. It means that you have duties and obligations that go along with your rights. There are rights, and that's why we have the Privileges and Immunities Clause, even though the Supreme Court has, has greatly minimized what that means. The 14th Amendment on Privileges and Immunities and Equal Protection and Due Process is taken from Roman law. The moderator rules that it's the difference. time for another question from the audience. Oh, good. I was just uh, uh, scanning my brain for Richard Epstein's Roman law class in law school to see if I needed to. <laughs> Um, uh, can, can you all preview uh, after this census the, uh, the, the litigation that's going to happen relating to citizenship? I mean, Evanwell was mentioned where the court said you don't have to have uh, uh, district lines drawn by uh, uh, citizens of voting age, CVAP. Certainly certain states are going to try to do that, so there'll be one question is can you uh, use CVAP, but what other things are going to be litigated? The Alabama case is already in process. I would say that I am, look, I am, would have high confidence that with a good citizenship data, uh, we're going to get to the point where two justices in will, which is it's permissible. Uh, we're talking about intrastate uh, redistricting, which, by the way, does have political salience because it rebalances the rural and urban counties. Uh, yeah, I don't personally care about the political salience. It's not an important issue. I happen to think that if well litigated, despite the case law that is well previewed in that world, that had to do with challenges to the uh, apportionment, uh, I am reasonably optimistic. Again, I not, didn't hear anybody make any observations. For the first time, if a court is presented with statistical data which shows that some states are augmenting their electoral promise and political power at the expense of other states because it's a zero-sum game, there's something wrong with it. It fundamentally undermines the original foundational bargain. That argument was never presented to the court. All the case law dealt with one person, one vote. And if the numbers are sufficiently dramatic, it would be very difficult for somebody who's an originalist to say, well, plus all the discussion about what a person versus inhabitant really mean in the context of, of, of Article I, uh, as well as the 14th Amendment. Uh, but I wouldn't go at it immediately. I would first start with interstate uh, redistricting. Sir. I want to thank Neil for being such a capable spokesman for his side in this debate. And my question is for him. Also, one of my table mates handed a question also okay. uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Neil. I would start with the correction, though. It's born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, and that's an active topic of discussion uh, in, uh, in these circles as to who is born a U.S. citizen as a matter of constitutional entitlement. Uh, but my question is, in Section 2, as, as David mentioned, in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, the precise wording is disenfranchised on the basis of representation representation therein shall be reduced in proportion in the proportion to which the number of male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in such a state. If redistricting has to happen, or, or if apportionment and representation has to happen on the basis of census numbers, those words were written in 1866. They were ratified in 1868. The census question was asked in 1820 and 30, not 40, but again in 50 and 60. Would the framers of the 14th Amendment have understood that in 80% of recent censuses, this question was always asked, 
That text to me seems to presuppose that they had that information off the census the way it was being asked at that time. So I'm curious as to why I'm wrong on that. Uh, the question for my seatmate is, if I hate your guts and you owe me $100,000, and I sue to collect the $100,000 you owe me without informing the court of my hatred for you, should my suit be thrown out, thrown out because I hate you? <laughs> Again, from, from, a, from an esteemed member of the room, not for me. Thank you. We're assuming that this is a rhetorical, uh, a hypothetical question. I, 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 think my, I think my friend has the highest respect for Good, thanks. <laughs> So on the second question, if the suit's against me, of course it should be thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> so on your, your first question, look, I'm, um, uh, I, I think the language, look, you, the first place, and this is a big conservative doctrine, right? The first place you go is not to legislative history. The first place you go is to the text of the Constitution. You can say what the framers may or may not have thought, but I think they wrote the words, which is counting the whole person. I think it's very hard to read that anywhere else. Obviously, there can be litigation over it, and I think there probably will be, and people like Mr. Rifkin will put in a brief saying it actually means something. Actually, it's probably Professor Baker will put in a brief saying it's actually inhabitants has some uh, long-time term of art. Interestingly, inhabitants is, is not in the Constitution, so it's kind of a... Well, a, the only, the well, only problem is that the Supreme Court has given deference to the last draft before the draft, on the final draft. On well, they, but my second point, which I think is actually quite interesting, which, which relates to sort of a, a foundation, there's really interesting scholarship has come out since the, uh, the decision came out, which, is, which was really calling into question the factual basis for much of Robert's opinion, that in fact, as a, as a I haven't done the research myself, but there's been research that I've read by respected uh, uh, academicians, that in fact the question has never been on a census as census, that it's always been to some subgroup that they ask frequently not about citizenship, but a lot of the questions were about where they were born, not where they were citizens, because the issue was, a, it was sort of an assimilation issue, frequently been asked to a subgroup, and then obviously since 1950 it's been, uh, as I understand it, largely asked for a subgroup. So look, I think there's gonna be a lot more uh, litigated about this, but, but that's sort of my general view of your question. Can I just add a 30 second point? I've not made it so far, but might as well share it with you today. Actually, I thought you can ask a different question. If you look at the language of section two, unless it's archaic, moribund, irrelevant, blah, 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 which is, is not, courtesy of, among other things, six justices of the Supreme Court. If you look at this language, it talks about male citizens 21 years old, which was a citizen baseline at that point in time. And it talks about cutting pro rata, if you deny suffrage, uh, your representation in the House. That language, ladies and gentlemen, can only work mathematically of using the CVAP for your baseline, okay? Because if you abridge the right of 10% of your citizens to vote, but your in representation in the House is padded by having a lot of non-citizens, then what are you going to be cutting? Question. No, no, th th again, I've not, I've not pointed, if we ever litigate this, I'll, I'll make a meal of it, but that is a validation of how the language, not just the, the intent, but the understanding that led to the language of Section 4 means that the people who proposed it voted in it had it ratified, had the same understanding of how Article 1, Section 2 works. Because otherwise it makes no sense mathematically, just play with the numbers. Well, look, can I just, I mean, look, in the same section you're arguing that person and citizenship have the same meaning. And, and I, I think most canons of construction would say that's absolutely not true. Look, can I just make another point? You made, you made uh, an argument about the 74 um, uh, case. Look, I think that case was largely whether or not, and I completely agree with you on this, Section 2 of Article 14 specifically says if, you're committed, if you've committed a crime, you can be excluded from the right to vote. And what the case basically decides is, I agree with you, if it's in the Constitution, it's not moribund. Um, and, and the court basically said, as that's, a, that's a permissible ground for excluding the right to vote, and we're not gonna punish you under Section 2 for that, but it doesn't, mean that every 10 years you have to count all the citizens because at some point in the future that nobody can possibly dream of, there might be some exclusion of males over the 20, age of 21 as a class from voting. And that's essentially what your argument does, I think. Anyway. Sir. Sure.
Well, it's clear that the uh, driver of the uh, census was originally for representation purposes. The functions of the United States government have substantially uh, changed over the years. If Secretary Ross had said, it's important that we know the numbers of citizens and non-citizens in the various jurisdictions across the United States because it affects a lot, a lot of welfare policies and other kinds of policies, would that have been defensible? Um, John, you want to well, take I'm a crack at that? I listened to the question, but I was initially going to respond this way, and I'll respond, and you tell me if it, it answers. I separate the constitutional from the statutory function of the census. And there is no reason why you can't split those two. And it would be quite possible to say we're only going to reapportion based on citizens and permanent legal residents, but we're going to distribute monies based on total population because there are population and they are straining the resources in the state and that's what, the way we want to distribute it. I think maybe if the White House or whoever came out with this distinction, you'd find a lot of the plaintiffs dropping off because in any particular census, it's marginal as to which states are affected. So last time Louisiana, this time Alabama. And basically, for many public officials and organizing groups, if their state is not affected in terms of representation, but they're sure to the money, they'll go on to other things. But if you had accurate information about persons who are citizens and non-citizens, and decided in your allocation process to implement that so that there would be a disincentive for states to have a lot of non-citizens but receiving public benefits. I'm not addressing that policy question. Yes, I think that California, which is losing many citizens, is replacing them with the illegals and which is keeping their dollars up. Yeah. Sir? Hi, Hansi Wong, reporter with NPR News. Uh, my first question is for Professor Baker. Uh, Professor Baker, one of the former uh, Commerce Department attorneys who was involved in the Trump administration's um, efforts to get a citizenship question, uh, James Uthmeyer, I believe, was a law school uh, student of yours. Yeah, and, that's true. And uh, Mr. Uthmeyer told the House Oversight Committee in a transcribed interview that you had been in discussions with him uh, when the Trump administration was preparing a request for a citizenship question. Can you confirm if you were in discussions with Mr. Uthmeyer? I had various conversations with my close friend, James Uthmeyer, on many subjects. Did you discuss um, a When you call me to the deposition, I'll answer your questions. Okay, I did send you an email a few months ago. Did you? Please. Um when you schedule a deposition, could you send a note to everybody here so we could all hear the whole show? Happy to do that. Uh, did you discuss uh, the use of citizen information for apportionment, congressional apportionment purposes with Mr. Uthman? There will be claim privileges made, okay? I'm not going to go into those. I don't have a lawyer here. <laughs> okay, I'm not a lawyer, sir. Remember, any lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. And if I can ask a question for Mr. Rifkin. Um, I'm just curious, why do you think adding a citizenship question to the 2030 census would be important, if I'm remembering correctly, you had said that earlier during the panel. Why would that be important, uh, given that the Census Bureau is now preparing, under the Trump administration's orders, uh, administrative records, which the Bureau says would be more accurate, and also uh, the distinction that um, Ms. Professor Breaker brought up earlier about the American Community Survey, how about a third Respondents uh, are giving false answers. So why would it be important to have two uh, two ans two two reasons? First of all, having information from two different sources: one obtained from statistical records by various government agencies and departments. Actual <coughs> actual enumeration. I'm not a statistician, but I believe that there are techniques of reconciling the the two baselines that would be useful. And second, the thing that, that excites me much more intellectually than all the APA stuff is again, I'd like, I'd like it resolved, frankly, not in a as depoliticized of a context as possible in modern day and age. Not in the context of this coming census, but for something that's gonna happen more than 10 years from now, whether or not it is permissible to be asking this question on the census, 
how seriously we should take the question of you know, suppression and equal protection. That's why one of the reasons I like Richardson case is because the challenge there was equal protection, uh, which resides in, in section one of the 14th Amendment. So I think it would be useful for us as a country to resolve this question without reference to a particular census and in a clean way, separating from who said what to whom, who spoke with whom, who testified about what. I mean, I don't know any good reason. Why, why not? What, what's wrong with that? And when you say a clean way, you mean in terms of... Uh, merits, merits as to whether or not it is, it is uh, in my opinion, it's constitutionally compelled. Uh, New disagrees with me, but at least it's constitutionally allowed. Again, we have five justices of the Supreme Court that, that yeah. say in this case uh, yeah. that it is allowed. Well, let's run it to the ground. Why not? We're, um, we're almost out of time. I'm going to uh, announce the moderator's prerogative of asking one last question to well, each I'm, of you I'm, after you say what you're okay, going to say. Look, years ago, the Census Bureau wanted to do a, a statistical model to distribute representation. And Congress, not experts, but res representing common sense, said no. What Wilbur Ross has done is proven that the political instincts of Congress were much better than the expertise of the statisticians. We don't have distribution of House seats based on a statistical model. We have an actual enumeration. Thanks. Here's my last question. Um, and could each of you, in order, John, David, Neil, uh, address it briefly? Um, stipulating that it would be nice to know a lot about the composition of the population, including citizens, illegal immigrants, and so forth. What, in your view, are the two most important reasons why we should know as much as possible about that? Why we should, including a question on the census. John? I come back to my distinction between citizens and non-citizens. And you know, we have people who come into this country and they get a green card and they choose never to become a citizen, and that can be a problem. That is, those who are legally on a path don't always become citizens. If we don't value citizenship and we don't teach it, which we're not, by, by and large, my concern is about citizenship. It means something. I made the comment about China, and I teach Chinese students primarily, and I love those Chinese students, but to call them citizens is false, unless all you mean is resident. And what the Census Bureau is doing is counting residents here, even embassy staffs, and they're not counting citizens who live abroad and who have the right to vote in this country, and they are denying them representation. Thank you, David. In my case, very briefly, uh, there could be a variety of, of, of perfectly legitimate reasons. It would help inform better debate about spending, about immigration policy, but the most fundamental reason, in my opinion, we at the very least have to give states an opportunity to use the CVAP numbers for interstate uh, districting. And if I'm right, I think that's a, a very important question in terms of of uh, constitutional architecture in the context of enumeration. And again, it's the American way to get the information and then we can debate about what it means. Not getting the information is, is, is a very bad way to proceed or trying to prevent the giving the information. One last point, if you read Evan Wheel carefully, one of our arguments used by folks who were opposing the use of citizenship data was that there's no reliable citizenship data. And by the way, uh, while there is going to be data now produced under the executive order, I would bet you my house that when people litigate against it, they would say this data is unreliable because it's not derived from enumeration. Full stop. Neil, you get the last word. Thanks. So uh, first, just before giving the last word, um, I'm usually the, the odd man out on these panels, but I just want to tell everybody how much I appreciate being invited and how much I appreciate the consideration that people get to give me, uh, even though I know for most of you, I'm not articulating views that you uh, think much of, and uh, so, I, so I appreciate that. So look, the, the, I think about this from a sort of a different viewpoint, which is that, as I mentioned earlier, this, this question to me has to do with the enumeration, which I believe calls for, for uh, counting persons, which I think is what the Constitution says. Again, there'll be some litigation whether persons actually mean citizens. I think that I have the better argument of that.
Don't forget the corporations now. Well, that's right. They just have, <laughs> they just have religious rights. I don't know if they can vote yet. Um, but um, and then I think apportionment equally is on the basis of um, uh, on the basis of persons and not on the basis of citizenship. But I would say, I mean, the outcome of the executive order that came out afterwards, and which is quite consistent actually with what the experts inside the Census Bureau uh, were saying, which is that asking the question on the census was not a way to get accurate information and disagreed with the secretary's determination that in fact asking it, doing it through these other ways and getting it through the enumeration would produce better data. He said actually what you're gonna end up with is a bunch of inconsistent data because of the likelihood that people aren't gonna answer correctly. And so if what you, let me just finish for a second. So, <laughs> So I think this, is, so the, but, but fundamentally, the, I, I think the issue is what does the Constitution require? And I believe that, that questions that interfere with the constitutional requirement of enumeration should not be permitted. Everything else is an add-on because people are gonna walk around and ask a bunch of questions anyway. But that's not what the, the Constitution talks about. It talks about counting the people in the United States. And, and, and I, I think that we'll do fine under the other method and frankly, as my friend David says, if it turns out Congress doesn't like it, this is an area, remember this is not a presidential power, this is an Article I of the Constitution, this is an Article I power that Congress has the power to alter so long as it complies with the Constitution. Neil, I apologize, I was All actually right. gonna ask you a question. All right. what, what do you want to bet, whether I'm right or wrong, that all this information generated from this superior statistical discernment method would be absolutely challenged any time somebody tries to use it as not being driven by enumeration. Am I fantasizing or you give me pretty good odds that that's gonna happen? Well, but I, I mean, I don't, will somebody challenge it? Of course, and someone will challenge it if it had been on the census. I mean, that's what we do in the United States. But, spe so, uh, <laughs> but challenge specifically because it's not derived from enumeration that in their opinion is constitutionally superior form of getting this information. Well, except if you remember, um, you know, this is sort of the issue we talked about sort of obliquely a little bit. Much of the fight is actually about distribution of money. Constitution doesn't compel that part of it. The Congress compels that part of it. They can divide up the money anywhere they want, and they don't have to follow uh, sort of the constitutional enumeration at all. I just think the Constitution compels how we do this, and adding this question it, uh, interferes with that constitutional duty. That's ultimately where I am. I think we're, we're, we're out of time, plus some. I'd like to thank all the panelists for wonderful remarks. Uh, thank, thank, thank the audience, uh, good questions, and I thank the Federalist Society for putting on affairs like this, which I think we can learn a lot from. <laughs>